invite our speaker, Dr. Bloom, to speak on the topic, Born in the Latter Days of the Dharma, Ecology and Eternity in a Song Dynasty Buddhist Monastery. Thank you. Thank you for your exceedingly kind introduction, uh, Dr. Kishnik. It's really a pleasure to be here, and I'm very grateful to Irene Lin for inviting me to speak today. Um, given that very generous introduction, I'm a bit intimidated to give my talk because it ended up being a bit different from what I had anticipated when I wrote the blurb. But hopefully I'll hit on some themes that will still be of interest. So let's get started. Three Buddhas sit on lotus thrones, encircled by bodhisattvas, monks, and two lay donors. Lining their niche shoulder to shoulder and facing directly toward the viewer worshiper, the figures seem to conform to our expectations of a Chinese Buddhist icon. Their formality, frontality, and stability together create a direct connection to their supplicant. Looking more closely, however, we note something unexpected. Cloud forms converge upon the head of each Buddha. The clouds stretch diagonally, rushing downward, as though to suggest that these beings have only just arrived from some distant realm. Ephemeral forms rendered in the eternal medium of sandstone, these clouds subtly introduce a sense of instant instantaneous manifestation into an otherwise conventional and static scene. Walking further along the cliff face, we come upon a series of niches, each similarly combining the conventionally iconic and the unexpectedly cumulus. Confucius sits in array with his ten disciples. Lao Tzu leans against a three-legged leg, three armrest as twelve of his followers pay court. Chittigarbha presides over the ten kings of purgatory and mountain gods, bodhisattvas, and even Buddhist thaumaturges also make an appearance. In every case, cloud forms insistently adorn each scene, perhaps suggesting the deity's momentary manifestation on these imposing cliff faces. So what exactly is going on here? Our peregrinations along two sandstone cliff faces, divided by a valley 500 meters in width, um, lead us to a total of 13 niches. And let's see, hopefully you can see. Um, so 10 of these niches are arrayed along this cliff face that's about 400 meters in length. Three more, uh, <coughs> three more niches as well as a uh, steely carved directly into a sandstone cliff face are here on this southern um, cliff face. And continuing another several hundred meters, we arrive at a small temple, Fu Hui Su, uh, the temple of the Buddha's assembly. Late Qing in architectural style, it houses a stele, curiously bordered again in cloud forms, rising from an incense burner, which you can see here. This is a Ming copy of a text dated to 1091 that actually was carved into one of the cliff faces that we saw earlier. And this is the original stele. Another 100 meters or so beyond stands a small stone pagoda um, entitled the Pagoda of the Buddha's Assembly, Fu Hui Ta, also distinctly Song in appearance. So ultimately, we roam several kilometers in total, traversing terraced fields, bamboo groves, and the remnants of coniferous forests. This is a decidedly unusual experience. After all, most cave shrines and cliff, sh ca cliff carvings are placed in close proximity to one another and to the monasteries that maintain them. Here, however, we have an experience of spatial expansiveness that unfolds slowly over a period of hours. Again, what exactly is going on here and why force visitors to roam widely through space and time to see images that insist on their instantaneity? In the end, what might be the function of this strange confluence of spaces and times? The thought-provoking images, fields, and 
architectures that I've just described are all part of a small 11th century Buddhist sanctuary located in uh, Dazu County, uh, part of Chongqing municipality in southwestern China. The many sandstone cliffs that run throughout Dazu have enticed carvers since the 7th century, and today it constitutes the largest repository of in situ Buddhist images of the Song dynasty. There are about 70 sites scattered throughout this uh, county, all of which have images carved into the cliffs. The most famous of them is called Baodingshan, uh, about which several books have been written in English. The site I'm going to be talking about, though, is called Shijuan Shan, or Stone Seal Mountain. From inscriptions at the site, we know that it was sponsored by a single lay patron named Yan Xun uh, between 1082 and 1096. Portraits of his wife and him appear in niches on both sides of the valley that I pointed out earlier. Yan Xun seems to have been a wealthy member of the local gentry who did not hold an official post, but instead made his fortune from his land holdings. It was he who composed the stele whose copy now stands in Fuhui Su, an invaluable primary source to which I'll refer repeatedly uh, in my presentation. So in today's talk, I want to investigate the function of Shijuan Shan's curious treatment of times and spaces, and I want to make two arguments about the site. On the one hand, uh, Shijuan Shan is a site in which ritual is perpetually performed. Essentially, it makes ritual acts, um, which typically are temporally and spatially circumscribed, always accessible. And it does so specifically through its use of cloud imagery, which I think serve as signifiers of rites of summoning and of the subsequent descent of deities. And in using the term ritual, I'm, I'm basically thinking about the guest host paradigm through, or by which many scholars characterize a number of Chinese Buddhist rituals. So basically the idea is that when you conduct a ritual, you're holding a feast for deities where you send out an invitation, the deities arrive, you feast them, you make some requests of them, and then send them off at the end. On the other hand, oh, and in thinking about this notion of eternal ritual, um, I'm going to draw especially on recent scholarship on things like Dharani pillars and pagoda relic crypts, studies that have suggested that material objects may actually have their own form of ritual agency. So the idea, in other words, is that objects themselves can perform ritual without human officiants. And at Shijuan Shan, I think the images are actually doing this. On the other hand, in laying physical claim to a vast spatial expanse and in encouraging visitors to roam through that space over the course of several hours, Shijuan Shan actually transforms the landscape itself into an agent of spiritual and possibly ritual transformation. We'll see that some Song worshippers actually considered natural forces, such as wind and rain, to be agents that could perform ritual in conjunction with material objects. At Shijuan Shan, however, the site as a landscape ultimately catalyzes visitors to become part of this ritual process themselves and to actually become a kind of ritual agent. Thus, the site seems to propose two models by which rituals spatial and temporal efficacy might be expanded. Ultimately, Shijuan Shan shows that ritual can be much more than the temporally and spatially circumscribed activity that we typically think it to be. Indeed, it demonstrates that pre-modern worshipers developed a variety of creative means of expanding uh, rituals, times, and spaces. I think uh, this reconceptualization of the relationship between landscape and ritual ultimately may have some impor important implications for how scholars of art, uh, ritual, and the environment approach their objects of study. And this is, um, although this comes out of some of the work that Professor Kieschnick mentioned, in particular my dissertation, um, this is still very much a work in progress. I've been thinking about this site for like nine years, and I still really don't feel like I get it. So I'm very happy for any comments and critiques you have. If this goes over well, great. If you feel like tearing it apart, great too. So please don't hold back um, during the Q&A. 
So uh, let's start with Shi Zhuangshan's images, and particularly with these clouds. And uh, as I said, I'd like to argue that clouds have a great deal to do with ritual, and in fact, may signify a kind of ongoing um, ritual activity at the site. Indeed, I think clouds transform otherwise conventional icons into representations of ritual activity. In this respect, Shi Zhuangshan uh, comes to share conceptual similarities with a variety of materials connected to the virtual performance of ritual, including Dharani pillars and pagoda relic crypts. So to make sense of these images, I think it's easiest to first look at the inscriptions that accompany them. Immediately surrounding a number of the images, of a number of the niches, are brief inscriptions left by the carvers who crafted them. And these short texts generally do little more than tell us the date that the niche was completed and the names of the artisans who crafted it. From these inscriptions, we know that the images were all carved between 1082 and 1096 by two generations of a family whose surname was Wen, uh, which was a family that was active in Dazu and in neighboring Anyue County uh, for about two centuries. This is <coughs> the, the, I didn't mention this earlier, but the two cliff faces are actually in different counties. Um, Ten of them are in Dazu, three of them are in Rongchang uh, County, which is part of Sichuan province. And these two counties have very different um, regulations regarding the preservation of historic images. And so consequently, the images in Dazu have been relatively well preserved in their kind of Song-like state, uh, whereas in Rongchang, they've continually been updated. And as you can see, some of the images have even been given new concrete heads in the past 10 years or so. Um, but that means that the, the images in Rongchang continue to be used actively by uh, local um, practitioners, whereas those in Dazu are more kept in a more museum-like state. So uh, two inscriptions, one accompanying the niche depicting Confucius and his 10 disciples, and the other accompanying the niche depicting the cosmic Buddha Vairochana, the historical Buddha Shakyamuni, and the future Buddha Maitreya, um, mentioned that a particular ritual was performed at this site in 1088. Specifically, uh, the inscription on the niche of Confucius and his 10 disciples recounts that on the seventh day of the first month of winter, so the 10th month in the lunar calendar, in the Wuchen year of the Yuanyo era, in other words, 1088, we held a waterland assembly in celebration. And the inscription on the niche of the three Buddhas records more or less the same. In other words, the completion of the images was celebrated with the performance of the Waterland Retreat, a ritual of universal salvation widely performed in China from the, tenth, or from the ninth century to the present. The ritual involves summoning all of the beings of the cosmos, as the, as the ritual calls it, all beings of water and land, to assemble within a ritual arena, where they are then bathed and offer, offered food, the teachings of the Buddha are recited for their benefit, and the summoned spirits include both Buddhist and non-Buddhist beings. And significantly, the non-Buddhist beings, particularly ghosts, are forced to convert um, to Buddhism. At the end of the process of this process of transformation, those non-Buddhist spirits newly converted are sent to be reborn into a higher path uh, of existence. And I'm showing you a painting from the 12th century that <coughs> depicts the performance of this ritual by a, a group of arhats who are here standing in for the mundane monks who normally would perform the ritual. And I'll, um, in just a second, you'll see why I'm identifying it specifically as the Waterland Retreat. Historically, the ritual was often performed to generate post-mortem merit, particularly for wartime casualties. And so in this painting in the background, I hope you can see there are all sorts of weird ghostly creatures emerging out of the mists. And all of those ghostly creatures are beings that have some connection to war. So you see soldiers, you see officers, you see state officials, you also see some martial deities um, who are manifesting in response to the monks ritualizing in the foreground. 
However, as Shi Zhuangshan's inscriptions attest, uh, the Waterland Retreat was also commonly performed to celebrate the completion of images, buildings, and bridges by bringing benefit to the myriad beings of the cosmos. And in particular, it was often performed if someone died during the construction process. It was kind of, um, it almost served as like an atonement um, for damages wrought by the construction process. I think it highly unlikely that Shi Zhuangshan itself, uh, particularly its niches, was actually constructed for the physical performance of this ritual. After all the site sprawls, nearly half a kilometer separates the monastery of Fu uh, from both sets of carvings, which are themselves divided by about 800 meters of what was in the past densely forested terrain. <clears throat> the, the situation at Shijuanshan is actually quite unlike uh, many Buddhist monasteries, even those that accompany cliff carvings or cave shrines. So for example, at Yungang, Dunhuang, and even at Baodingshan and Dazu, which you see on the screen, temples and caves exist in close proximity to one another, the temple serving as a residence for the monks who maintain the carvings and perform offerings to them. At Shi Zhuangshan, on the other hand, we have a vast uh, physical separation between the carvings and the monastery. Consequently, I think um, it's rather unlikely that rituals other than simple offerings um, of a kind of devotional sort were ever performed before the carvings themselves. Instead, I think it's much more likely that the temple halls themselves served as the focus of physical ritual activity. And you're seeing the interior of the main hall of the monastery as it stands today. The um, hall was reconstructed in, at the very beginning of the 20th century. Um, and you can see that it, you know, it's still outfitted with the icons that you, you would need for sort of regular uh, offertory rituals. Further, uh, Ming Dynasty steles at this site record that in fact, multiple halls existed at the monastery during the Ming. And the names of the uh, halls, things like the Dharma, uh, Dharma Hall, Image Hall, Retreat Hall, all suggest relatively large spaces um, that uh, could have accommodated large uh, ritual assemblies. At the same time, however, I do think that a similar cosmic uh, logic underlies both the Waterland Retreat and Shi Zhuangshan. Specifically, both the ritual and the site itself share an ecumenical pantheon that covers all dimensions of time and space, as well as Song China's diverse religious traditions. Yen Xun's stele uh, actually provides a convenient overview of the deities depicted, and he arrays them in a very clear hierarchical order. So he tells us that at the head of the assembly are, of course, completely awakened Buddhas. In this case, um, the Buddhas of the pa uh, present, Shakyamuni, um, the future Maitreya, and the cosmos, Vairochana. So you have Vairochana seated in the center with Shakyamuni and Maitreya to the sides. Um, in another niche, Tija Prabha, the kind of astral Buddha, is depicted surrounded by representatives of the 11 asterisms. Next in the list come Bodhisattvas, um, specifically Manjushri and Samantabhadra, Avalokiteshvara, who's being af actively supplicated by Yen Shun and his wife, and then Chitigarbha and the Ten Kings of Hell. Yen continues on to include the founding figures of China's two formalized indigenous religious traditions, Taoism and Confucianism. And he continues uh, with a number of rather more eclectic figures, um, including uh, the fifth century thaumaturge uh, Bao Zhi, a monk who was an advisor to Emperor Wu of the Liang Dynasty, both of whom were regarded as founders of the Waterland Retreat. Um, the saintly mother Hariti, who was, is the paradigmatic object of rites of food distribution, but who also was widely worshipped in the Song in relation to supplication for childbirth. And then uh, he also, uh, Yen Xun also includes figures like the 7th century physician uh, Sun Sumiao. 
Yen concludes his pantheon with the local earth and mountain gods that were likely understood to protect Shi Zhuanshan itself, as well as a pagoda that he says would eternally guard the site. Um, so to summarize this kind of eclectic pantheon, um, I think we can think about it in spatial and temporal terms. On the one hand, Shakyamuni, Lao Tzu, and Confucius point us to the past, while Maitreya points us to the future. The earth and mountain gods take care of Shi Chan itself, while Tija Prabha takes care of the stars. Shadigarbha, meanwhile, delivers the condemned from hell, while Avalokiteshvara, um, the medicine king, Sun Sumyal, and the king of longevity all take care of more immediate, this worldly concerns. These are also all figures that appear within extant manuals for the Waterland Retreat from this period. And I can talk about the relationship between the pantheon at this site and the pantheons invoked in the ritual in the Q&A. So consequently, I'd argue that the site and the ritual are complementary. In a sense, Shi Zhuanshan seems to provide a space for eternal encounters with deities who otherwise only would be present during the time of ritual. Whereas the deities summoned during a ritual performance are typically dispatched at its end, and the painted images of them are stored away, at Shi Zhuanshan, these deities remain eternally present thanks to their stone medium. Uncovering these initial conceptual connections between the ritual and Shi Zhuanshan, I think, also helps us to make sense of the ubiquitous cloud motifs at the site. Specifically, we can begin to see these clouds as signifiers of the descent of deities in response to rites of summoning. So as we saw earlier, um, small roiling banks of clouds are carved to the side of the heads of many of the most important figures at the site. Um, Confucius and every one of his disciples somehow has, have clouds around their heads, which seems very odd to me. And yet, there they are. Um, Lao Tzu and his disciples to clouds. Kshitigarbha gets a cloud. Uh, this is not something that I've really encountered in any other site that I've looked at. Though as I'll explain in just a moment, it's something that I've encountered a lot uh, in painting. Meanwhile, on each side of the facade of certain niches, such as uh, the niche that houses the three Buddhas, um, clouds are shown surrounding and propelling forth the protective deities uh, that watch over uh, stone Dharani pillars on which inscriptions about the niches are engraved. Further banks of clouds end up being found throughout the site, including surrounding niches, um, and even serving as the border for stele. In this particular example, um, this bank of clouds is actually emerging out of a small incense burner, as though the text is somehow appearing in a fragrant vision. Despite their ubiquity in Chinese Buddhist art of the Song and after, uh, clouds are rarely mere decorations. Instead, I think they often carry a specific ritual valence. They indicate deities' descent into the ritual arena, a process that's induced through physical and mental acts carried out by liturgists. And manuals for the performance of the Waterland Retreat, as well as artworks specifically crafted for it, prove particularly useful in illuminating the import of the cloud. And I'm going to use a 13th century manual for the Waterland Retreat to illustrate my points. Um, I'm using it because it's the earliest complete extent uh, text related to this ritual that we have. There are some excerpts of earlier manuals that we could also discuss later, but this 13th century manual is useful in that it includes both physical acts as well as mental acts. <coughs> um, also, I should mention that we know that the Waterland Retreat was being actively performed in this part of Sichuan, at least from about the 10th century onward. Um, So it's in the acts of summoning spirits, both saintly and mundane, that clouds play a particularly important role in the visual imagination of the Waterland Retreat. 
Uh, the sequence of summoning begins with the purification of the ritual arena by one particular monk, uh, the cantor, the Biaobai. He uh, then intones the names of the spirits he's summoning, and he prays that they'll hasten to the ritual arena. Upon hearing that prayer, the assembly of liturgical personnel collectively invite the spirits with incense and flowers, and then symbols are clattered, signaling to another monk, uh, the ritual master, the Fa Shi, uh, to begin an act of mental visualization. The visions he sees differ slightly for each class of beings that are summoned. So for example, uh, the Buddhas are said to come of themselves, filling the void. Bodhisattvas come without coming. Arhats arrive from the void solemnly and stately, and lesser spirits come from the four directions or from below the earth. The sequence repeats itself until the entire ritual arena is filled with unseen beings. Then a mantra of summoning is triply intoned to ensure that the invocations have been efficacious. Finally, symbols are clattered again, spurring the ritual master to execute a concluding visualization in which he sees the myriad spirits gathering like clouds to abide within the ritual arena. Such a sequence, which involves both physical and mental activity, and which includes both oral hom homilies and interior visions, makes clear that the cloud comes to signify um, the deity's descent into the ritual arena. These deities are really imagined to come out of the void and to assemble, as you see, like clouds within this space. Of course, we should also note that it's often incense, itself a kind of nebulous olfactory stimulant that serves to induce Buddhist deities' cloud-borne descent. Whenever an offering is made or a ritual is performed, incense is always burned to incite that, the deity's response. And in fact, in other moments of the Waterland Retreat, liturgists will burn incense and specifically imagine that it transforms into fragrant cosmic clouds, which in turn carry the deities into the ritual arena. And so I'm showing you an image of, uh, again, from a, a 12th century set of paintings, where a group of arhats are shown descending on a cloud bank toward a monk who's being depicted making an incense offering and looking upward. And rather significantly, the smoke from his incense burner is actually conjoining with the cloud that's carrying these arhats down into the ritual space. Although this particular painting is dealing specifically with the context of an offertory ritual called the Arhat Offering, Lo Han Gong, um, it's the same kind of conceptual schema that you end up finding throughout the Waterland Retreat anytime a deity is summoned, as well as in numerous other rituals. So it's no surprise then that escalator-like banks of clouds fill paintings of deities crafted for the Waterland Retreat. Um, on the screen, you see several of the earliest extant examples, all from about the year 1200, um, which show myriad Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, and monks descending on clouds. <coughs> Assemblies of deities descending on clouds become, in fact, a visual hallmark of the ritual. Um, of course, we can also note that uh, in visual materials associated with other rituals of assembly, you end up having a similar kind of cloud-borne descent. And probably the best example of this, besides the Waterland Retreat, are materials related to the summoning of devas during rites uh, for the uh, golden light uh, repentance um, ritual. And so this is an example from the Freer Gallery that just simply shows one, one deva of the 12, 16, or 20 that would normally be summoned uh, during one of the Golden Light uh, Repentance. So I'd argue then that Shi Zhuanshan's ubiquitous cloud motifs are performing a similar conceptual role, indicating that these deities are not mere icons as we would normally expect, but in that instead these figures are manifesting in response to some sort of act of invocation. In being rendered in the eternal medium of stone, the clouds and the deities that they bear are always present, and the ritual acts that they signify are eternally performed. Through this confluence of the ephemeral, that is clouds and the eternal stone, ritual exceeds its temporal bounds. 
These images thus allow viewers an eternal experience of the ephemeral. They provide a visual language for everlasting ritual. Significantly, the concept of the eternal performance of ritual acts and the complementary notion that merit might be continually generated through material means actually, I think, occurs in a variety of different Buddhist contexts. And I'd just like to talk about a couple of examples that I think will clarify the importance of this uh, phenomenon uh, within the song. Um, but first, a very obvious example, namely Tibetan uh, prayer flags, which are easily understood as a ritual technology that harnesses wind to recite the texts printed on their surfaces. Through this confluence of natural forces and ritual objects, the entire cosmos ostensibly is filled with the virtual sound of those texts, and consequently, we all are suffused with their blessings. In Song China, uh, images and objects themselves were understood to perpetually perform ritual as well. Many of the carvings throughout Dazu County, for example, are inscribed as having been donated in perpetually abiding offering. In other words, by virtue of their eternal presence, the images themselves would continue to perform uh, offerings to the Buddhas. And unlike the prayer flags, there seems to have been no need for any agent other than the object itself. Contemporaneous paintings, uh, which were specifically crafted for offertory rituals, were inscribed as having eternally, or as eternally serving in reverent offering. Again, I think the logic is the same. Moreover, <coughs> The work of scholars like Eugene Wang and Yunmi Kim uh, has shown that the interior relic crypts of Tang, Song, and Liao pagodas may well have constituted spaces for the eternal performance of ritual. ritual. So for example, the Chaoyang North Pagoda uh, from 1044, uh, located in Liaoning province, pairs inscriptions of mantras and mandalas with a variety of ritual implements. They're all arrayed according to manuals for the performance of Dharani chanting rituals. And significantly, these objects are all placed within a small stone box that's about three feet on each side. And that stone box was found in one of the upper stories of the pagoda in a space that was completely sealed to human ritualists. So not only was the space sealed, but also it was a space too small for any human to ever actually enter. Consequently, Yin Mi Kim has argued uh, that <clears throat> the existence of these implements themselves within a small sealed space surrounded by inscriptions of mantras and mandalas likely implies that the implements themselves were conceived of as performing the ritual virtually. The material objects themselves become the agents in such a schema. Such a conception of material agency is, in a sense, inherent to the Dharani cult. Um, as is well known, by simply passing through the shadow of a pillar inscribed with a Dharani or being anointed with dust blown from it, the worshiper could receive the blessings that typically would be associated with other forms of textual practice, such as chanting. In such circumstances, the text itself might be understood to possess a form of agency <laughs> that's activated through the media of the pillar and the shadow or dust. Consequently, natural forces, text, and object combine together to virtual transformative effect. The specifically ritual efficacy of such a confluence of forces was actually explicitly articulated in the song. For example, the 12th century scholar official Cao Xun wrote that two texts were engraved on stone pillars that were placed on opposite sides of a river valley that had been the site of a major battle um, between the Jin and uh, the, the Jurchen and the Song. The inscribed pillars, he says, uh, were erected so that the grasses and trees, the wind and rain, might bolster the sound of the scriptures and carry over the souls of the dead. So the pillars thus defined a space of eternal salvation using rain, wind, and stone to create an everlasting aural ritual environment. The forces of nature were catalyzed through the medium of stone carving to create a form of ritual power. Of course, the images at Shijuan Shan are a bit different from all of the examples I've just cited. 
<coughs> Shijuanshan is a site that's centered on images, whereas the examples I've been talking about all fall into affiliation with the textual Dharani cult. Um, though I should note that Dharani pillars actually show up all over this site as it uh, surfaces for inscription. Nevertheless, I think the underlying impulses behind uh, these various forms of practice are similar. The designer of Shijuanshan has sought to render ritual, typically an ephemeral, temporally circumscribed act, eternal through his use of the visual language of ritual. And as we'll sh shortly see, Yan Xun, uh, the site's patron, actually wrote very specifically about the ritual efficacy of Shijuanshan a place that he also ultimately sees as a site that both eternalizes virtual ritual and whose environmental ritual matrix is itself performed by visitors. So in my remaining time, I'd like to take a closer look at the stele that Yan Xun um, inscribed on the surface of one of the cliffs at Shijuanshan. The original stele, uh, which is heavily damaged and which you see on the screen now, uh, was not known to scholars until 2003, when the child of a local farmer happened upon three niches that had been covered by a landslide sometime in the late 19th or early 20th centuries. Um, the text had actually been copied in the Ming Dynasty on a new stele that was placed within Fu Huisu itself. And the stele provides a comprehensive vision of Shijuanshan and its grounds helping us to make sense of its spatial and temporal relations to Yin's creative vision of ritual. Ultimately, I think the stele reveals that the various constituent elements of Shijuanshan were constructed to lay claim to the valley as a whole, transforming its entirety into an environmental ritual arena for the transformation of visitors. The stele is dated to the 15th day of the second month, the date of the Buddha's nirvana, um, in 1090, and it bears a rather menacing title. A record warning people against damaging the various icons and felling the conifers and plants before and behind the niches and pagoda. Fundamentally, it's a list of regulations for the use and protection of the site, but it's framed in rather, uh, uh, that list of regulations is framed in a rather significant way. So the stele begins with a brief history of Buddhism, a fairly conventional compositional choice. Yen claims that Buddhism has survived multiple imperial purges because it helps um, the ignorant avoid harm and pursue the good, and because it helps the wise to realize the nature of things and to accord with principle. In other words, it basically helps everyone to become a Buddha. Yen also notes that Buddhism serves as a supplement to Confucian rites a notion that was not uncommon, but also not uncontroversial in the soul. Yen then goes on to lay out the bleak spiritual conditions of his own spiritual life, conditions that led him to sponsor this private Buddhist retreat. He recounts, I've read the writings of the Buddha, I've carried out practices throughout the years and held, have held retreats for some days. However, Having been born at the end of the Buddha's Dharma, I'm not intimate with the Buddha's assembly. I cannot invite the gods down as I'm far distant from the time of the Buddha. The longing to perform the affairs of the Buddha, I was not able. Thus, I'm expending all of my energy to carry out this project, spending 500,000 coins to purchase a renowned spot called Stone Seal Mountain in the area where I live. Here, I've cleared the cliffs to carve a total of 14 images. So Yen clearly was concerned about a number of things, particularly his distance, both spatial and temporal, from the Buddha Shakyamuni. In, indeed, as we saw, he explicitly mentions having been born at the end of the Dharma, the time when the teachings of Shakyamuni will degenerate and eventually disappear. Of course, it's believed that his teachings will be renewed with the arrival of the future Buddha Maitreya, um, who Yen Shun actually has depicted at his site. To overcome the seemingly inexorable decline of the Dharma, however, Yen would create his own space suitable for the descent of deities and for the performance of rituals. Yen's sanctuary was to be structured around a carefully planned collection of images, as we saw earlier. And after clarifying the content of those niches, 
he goes on to talk about the site more broadly. And he tells us, before and behind the left and to the right of the niches, halls, and tower, I also planted conifers, literally pines and cypresses, and various flowering and fruiting trees. By 1090, the various images were almost complete, and that which had been planted was flourishing. In the spring and on festival days, Shijuanshan often serves as a site where local people worship and that they visit together. I think this passage suggests several interesting things about Yen's conception of Shijuanshan. Most notably, he seems to have considered the botanical features of the site to be almost as important as the images and architectural structures that he sponsored. His cultivated landscape existed very much in symbiosis with the site's artificial features. Through the confluence of the natural and the artificial, Shijuanshan became an important local tourist attraction its images and flowering trees proving particularly alluring in the spring. And as you can see today, it's not particularly alluring anymore. Um, it's, it probably was deforested sometime in the Qing and um, it, much of the land is now used primarily for agri agriculture. The site is largely terraced uh, for farming rather than uh, forested as it once was. But rather interestingly, Yen also specifies that people came to Shijuanshan both as wor worshippers and as tourists. And we might imagine them paying homage to the images and then wandering through its forested hills. The site thus seems to have had a dual profile, as remains true today and as likely has been true throughout the site's existence. So this is a photograph of one of um, the niches in Rongchang County that's in active use by local um, villagers as a site of worship. Um, this particular active use of the site can be contrasted with the use of the, the niches on the northern side of the site in Dazu County, which essentially only scholars ever visit. Um, they're not used actively by locals at all. So even today we get a little bit of the touristic versus um, uh, a more religious use of the site. In the following section of his steely yen's tone suddenly shifts, and his text actually begins to read like a list of museum regulations. He quite directly says, don't touch the art, don't damage the plants, and don't misbehave. And particularly, he tells you not to get drunk on the site. But more interestingly, he also proclaims, in an area of Tenjiang, so about 31 meters or 100 feet, around the niches, halls, and tower, one must not build any structure. Instead, one should exclusively plant conifers and fruiting and flowering trees. For it can be said that that which protects the structures will wear out if not mended for some time, and that as the conifers mature, the older they become, the denser will their shadows be. It's against my wishes that people should, without thinking, inappropriately cut down these trees. In other words, not only do the site's botanical elements constitute a place of pleasure for visitors, but they also fulfill a protective function for its artificial features. But as we'll see in just a minute, these botanical features also are instrumentalized to ritual ends. In the following section of the text, Yen goes on to explicate more fully how these regulations will bring benefit to the site. And he invokes a botanical metaphor to anchor his account of the site's eternal efficacy. And he proclaims, the aforementioned three points are indeed not my intentions in crafting these images. If one does not know what should be forbidden, then I fear this site for sowing fortune will also come to grow the roots of misfortune. Of course, this is a foundational metaphor for Buddhist practice. To make offerings to the Buddhas, to do good deeds, to perform ritual, is metaphorically to plant the fields of fortune or to cultivate the roots of goodness that will lead one to blossom into Buddhahood. Of course, in the case of Shijuanshan, this is more than a metaphor. Yenshin has physically planted, or did physically plant a forest that will generate such good karmic roots. And then he goes on to suggest that those karmic, those roots, the literal um, botanical roots will bear fruit before concluding with some insights into his biography and familial relationships. And I'll skip that concluding section of the stele. So regarding his vision of the site's efficacy, he writes, 
if the niches, halls, tower, and images that we craft today are equally protected, if the conifers and arbors ten jung before and behind to the left and right of the niches, halls, and tower are not felled, then all people who visit and worship will generate a joyful heart. They'll together give rise to compassionate action and will together carry out the affairs of the Buddha. In doing so, they'll fulfill my intentions and I will rejoice. Conceptually, I think this is the key passage in Yen Stili, as it's a passage that clarifies the connections among the site uh, and its efficacy. In essence, Yen declares that the site's images and forests will collectively inspire visitors to re rejoice and to do good of their own accord. Shijuan Shan thus will become something like a site for the perpetual generation of good karmic roots. It will inspire visitors to sow seeds of goodness, which will in turn inspire others and so on in perpetuity. But Yin's use of the term affairs of the Buddha for Shi, I think is of particular interest as the term can refer as much to ritual action as it does to any other form of Buddhist activity. And of course, in modern Chinese, this is still one of the more common terms for ritual. Given Yen's claims at the beginning of the text, specifically his saying that he carried out practices, he held retreats, and he was not able to meet with the Buddha's assembly, I think it's very likely that he means affairs of the Buddha as ritual. Ultimately, then, I, I wonder if he conceives of, rich, of Shijuan Shan as a site for the eternal generation of merit that will inspire visitors to ritualize on their own. In the end, then, I think Shijuan Shan functions as something like an eternal environmental ritual framework, a site whose landscape ima and images eternally catalyze visitors to create something of their own ritual power. The site's images, buildings, and forests collectively work together to inspire visitors' devotion to the Buddhist path. They encourage us to sow good karmic roots, to rejoice in the Buddha's teachings, and to perpetually carry out the Buddha's affairs. At the same time, though, um, through his specific inclusion of cloud imagery, Yen transforms Shijuan Shan into a site in which ritual acts of invocation are constantly being performed where it's possible to always meet with these deities in a way that normally would only be possible during the time and in, during the time and in the space of a ritual uh, performance. Indeed, the images at this site nuance the model of the eternal environmental ritual framework that Yen Shun describes in his stele, as the site does not merely use images and forests to eternally inspire visitors to carry out ritual, it also allows visitors to experience something of uh, ritual through the niches. In linking the instantaneity of ritual to the eterna eternality of stone, and in laying claim to the entirety of the mountaintop and valley, Shijuan Shan becomes a multidimensional matrix through which the spatial and temporal limits of ritual are exploded. The foregoing discussions, I think, have shown, I hope, that uh, Yen Shun sought to link images, architectures, and forests to create a personal sanctuary that would inspire visitors to be good Buddhists. In particular, he seems to have hoped that visitors would carry out ritual just as he himself did at the site. And further, he seems to have drawn on conventions of representation associated with ritual of my beloved clouds to give visitors an everlasting experience of deities that otherwise might only be present during liturgical performance. Significantly, Shijuan Shan renders these ritual acts not only eternal, but also environmental. After all, to view all of the site's images, one must wander from one side of the valley to the other, traversing the flourishing for forest that Yen cultivated. For Yen, it seems to have been the combined experience of viewing images and wandering through the forest that would together awaken in visitors a devotion to the Buddha and his path. In linking these two visions, Shijuan Shan ultimately exceeds the models of eternal virtual ritual that we examined in relation to the Dharani cult and pagoda relic crypts. Um, Shijuan Shan does not merely create a space in which objects ritualize on their own. 
Instead, it links that activity to a broader environment that encourages visitors themselves to learn from those images and to perpetuate ritual on their own. Material agency is thus linked to human agency and expanded both temporally and spatially. But so what, <clears throat> what broader conclusions might we draw from this discussion of forests and niches in a remote corner of China? I think Shi Zhuanshan serves as a compelling reminder that ritual can be much more than the temporally and spatially circumscribed activity that we, or at least I, typically think it to be. Ritual doesn't necessarily take place only in a specific space at a specific time. Instead, Shi Zhuanshan testifies that pre-modern worshipers developed remarkably creative means of, crea of expanding rituals' spatial and temporal ranges of efficacy. Shi Zhuanshan then should encourage us to think about whole landscapes, how whole landscapes could have functioned in efficacious ways. And of course, scholars of pilgrimage and mountain cults invariably take environmental considerations into account. But I hope that Shi Zhuanshan might also encourage historians of art and ritual to reconsider the spatial dimensions of ritual and its art. Moreover, I hope that this account of Shi Zhuanshan might also spur consideration of different scales of time when thinking about liturgy from the time of a single ritual performance to the eternal forms of practice promoted by Yan Xun. Thank you.